So today we're going to talk about what is public health in general, um, what are epidemics and pandemics as a definition since that's your end result is to create one. How does public health and medicine work together during these incidences? I'm going to give you a local example of what happened during the Ebola um, thing here in the Akron area. And then we're going to wrap up. Um, public health, there's a couple definitions, um, but basically they all end up being the same. Um, according to the CDC Foundation, public health is a science of protecting and improving the health of people and their communities. It's achieved by promoting healthy lifestyles, researching injury prevention, um, detecting, preventing, and responding to these infectious diseases. Um, overall, public health is concerned with protecting the health of entire populations as well as very small ones. You know, so we cover the gamut of what a population actually would be anywhere from a very small company who's receiving corporate wellness initiatives to a very large um, population such as you know, dealing with the Ebola outbreak or even on the United States level. Um, and these populations, like I said, can be small or big. This is um, from the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization says that it is defined as the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. Um, they have to look at it on a, on a global scale, and we'll talk about the differences in public health from a global scale all the way down to a local level. Um, in order to achieve this vision, and their overall vision is to promote greater health and well-being in a sustainable way, meaning sustainability means that it keeps going on its own. Um, it may need tweaks here and there, but sustainability means that it just continues because you've set up a good uh, framework and foundation. While strengthening integrated public health services and reducing inequalities. And they do this through um, working with other sectors to address the wider determinants of health with health professionals. Primary health care professionals can play a key role in preventing illness and promoting health as well as outlined in their declaration that they have created. And what this is saying is that public health is all about collaboration. And I'll go over some of those collaborations and how they work with epidemics and pandemics and helping to keep um, society as a whole healthy. So this here is basically the public health structure at the very top of this structure is the World Health Organization, what's known as the Health Assembly, UNICEF, and there are other several worldwide organizations, but this is the top of the structure. They look at things on a much broader level. A lot of times they do some of the top research, they have some of the top initiatives, and um, they have some of the top healthcare professionals working for them as well, and people look to them as an authority. Here at the United States level, we have the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we have the EPA, um, the FDA, and many other um, entities at the national level, which do the same for us here on a um, national level. They give us most of the funding that now goes into public health. Um, lots of people apply for NIH grants. They do research grants. They apply for uh, grants through the EPA if they're into environmental things. The FDA provides grants for drug trials and things like that. So these are the major entities that we look to for our professionalism and um, and. Um, authority in the United States. Then it goes down to the local level. State health departments, um, as she said that Chip was here uh, last time, uh, county health departments. We do have several county health departments in the area. We have a Portage County Health Department, Mahoning County Health Department, Summit County Health Department, and then some places if their counties are smaller or they are very large um, to where a county itself cannot take care of that, they have a local health department. And Cleveland is one of these. They have an actual Cleveland Department of Public Health. And then they also have the Cuyahoga County Health Department. So it really depends on how many individuals that they're dealing with and what the needs of that community are, whether they have more or not. So public health itself is a system. And this system all has to work together. They have to, we all have to collaborate. Sometimes we operate in what's called silos. And silos is where one organization will be doing some work over here. Let's use um, a food desert, for example. Does everybody know what a food desert is? Okay, so say that there are a lot, I know that uh, in, in Mahoning County and in Youngstown, they have 
there's been some research done and they have quite a few food deserts. In fact, in the city of Youngstown itself is one huge food desert because they don't have a lot of grocery stores, they don't have a lot of healthy food options, they don't have um, a lot of things that people can easily access who live there. And as students, if you guys live near campus or on campus, you probably realize this, right? So. What happens is that there's a lot of agencies in Youngstown working towards reducing uh, the disparity of food deserts within the city. However, they're not collaborating together. I just had a, an MPH student who did um, an, a community assessment to find out who is doing what in the community. And what he found is that they're all operating in these little silos. So there will be like 10 agencies who are trying to increase um, food distribution in the area, but none of them know what the other one is doing. So they have no idea. So they're all like in this little linear place, but, and they're all there, they're doing the same thing, but they don't know what the other one's doing. And then you have um, people who are trying to bring grocery stores actually, you know, they're working towards um, giving incentives and applying for grants and things like that to bring actual grocery stores with healthy options into the city. So they're looking for places to put it. Um, they're trying to get them um, permits and, and things like that. But yeah, there's several little organizations who are doing this and they're all going after the same money and some of them are getting denied so they're in another silo so what we have to do in public health is that we all have to figure out what everybody else is doing and work together because when you do that the grant monies become larger then you can divvy them up your grant opportunities become more easy so because you're writing for a larger sector and you can get it out to more people then it's going to be easier to receive that grant so that's what collaboration is all about in public health. So it's not just a single product or service provided by one professional. It's just not, we can't, there's nothing that's gonna be achieved that way. It's a web of relationships between many people and organizations about a wide variety of topics and public health can cover anything and everything. I always ask students whenever I go to talk to them in high school, tell me one thing that you think does not deal with public health. And they'll say things like, oh, we're in a building. I'm like, oh no, that's public health, housing authority. And then they'll say, oh, well, you know, our food. I'm like, oh no, that's nutrition and uh, that's the FDA and that's public health, you know? And so they always try and come up with something. There isn't anything that you deal with any day of your life that does not have to do with regulations or policies that have to do with public health. Um, the web of relationships ser serves to assure conditions that result in a healthy public. That's our overall goal. And the responsibility for assuring the health of the public rests in specific agencies at different levels, and that includes local, state, federal, and international. So these are some of the top state and local responsibilities in public health. Um, we, most public health departments now have somebody who deals with bioterrorism, who deals with some sort of um, um, you know, emergency preparedness and planning. They have one person in that health department who deals with all of that. Um, of course, vaccines for children is still one of the major things. It's one of the first things that health departments started doing historically. Um, this is how public, one way that public health started is that during, um, which we'll talk about some of the major epidemics that happened and the development of vaccines and how did they get that out? They got that out through public health and that's how they communicated it and, and um, got people to come in and get vaccinated. Of course, there's injury control, um, lots of cancer screenings, violence prevention, Shin, um, environmental stuff, EMS, and lead and radon control. So public health departments actually, especially at the local level, have to take on a whole lot depending on their communities. Top world health issues. Um, I found this a while, I found this last year I was doing um, an article for something and I found this thing that said that there are t these are the 10 top world health issues and it didn't print out so. <laughs> I couldn't get it to fit on here, but uh, sparks of innovation from unexpected places. What they're finding is, for example, in Uganda, there is a lot of medical research coming out of Uganda. 
someplace that nobody expected. And we're learning a lot of things from them. So they're sending, you know, Doctors Without Borders and other medical people there to learn about some of these new innovations. And people are surprised. They're like, wow, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there's this explosion in healthcare knowledge and research coming out of this little country. And so people are going to learn about it. So we're, we are getting a lot of information from unexpected places, but you know, being the United States, and or Europe didn't tend to listen to that stuff. But now we're realizing that we have to, we have to listen to them. We're not the only ones of authority and with all of the knowledge and the ability to do research. Okay, our, I think our time is kind of coming, waning down. So now we have to start listening to other countries who also are coming up with these great inventions and knowledge. The second one is fake news and misinformation. One of the, can you guys tell me what one of the biggest fake news and misinformation faux pas was of, of our time? Can anybody tell me what it was? They can. <laughs> She's back there laughing. You, can any of you guys tell me? It is that the MMR vaccine creates autism. That has perpetuated and perpetuated and perpetuated. And this was all done by a physician who literally did this because he was angry, because he didn't get the patent that he wanted for his vaccine. So what he said was that the MMR vaccine that was put out created autism. He faked all of his studies, he faked all of his research, and it was published in The Lancet, which is one of the top medical journals of all time. So therefore, when it came to retraction, the Lancet doesn't ever retract anything. They finally did retract it, but the damage had already been done. And to this day, his article is causing many, many, one of the, it's going to be an epidemic soon. One of the biggest problems that we have in public health today, and that is unvaccinated children. And all because of one research article. That's it. One person, one research article created all of this havoc. Um, HIV pandemic at a crossroads. They are really, you know, it's at a point where, you know, people aren't going HIV ah, anymore. They don't, you know, people aren't afraid of it like they used to be. And um, the information that's getting out there is slowing down and waning. And the research is starting to slow down. Um, because now if somebody does contract HIV, it's considered a lifelong disease. It's no longer considered a death sentence. And so they're at a crossroads here where it is still a major, major pandemic across the, the world. Um, especially in Africa still, because there are so many misconceptions and fake news and misunderstanding and even government putting out deliberate misinformation that they're really at a crossroads where there are some countries who really have it under control and some that it's still out of control. So it's a really hard place to be right now. The diseases we know about and the ones we don't. There are so many new diseases coming out. In fact, I read an article and I forget exactly which MRSA strain it was, but this MRSA strain used to only be found in hospitals and now they're seeing it in college dorms, they're seeing it in um, football locker rooms, they're seeing it in daycare centers, and it's scary because it used to only be contained within hospitals. And now they're seeing this specific MRSA strain that's pretty scary strain out there in the public where it never used to be. So we know about these diseases but we can't do much about them because the bacteria is so smart and powerful. But then there are so many more diseases that we don't know about that are out there that the more knowledge we get, the more research we do, we're learning about them, but we don't know what to do about them. So I was just at a um, presentation for a student who did a research paper on malaria. And although we don't have a malaria problem really here in the United States, across the world they still do. The problem is that you know, here's me. Sometimes I'm pretty naive about this stuff. I'm like, why don't they just create a vaccine for malaria? He's like, we have them. The problem is that they don't last lifetime. They last for a very short time span. And so people don't keep coming back to be vaccinated. Or they don't think to get their children vaccinated during high mosquito season. So although they understand malaria pretty well, they still don't know how to stop it from being from they still don't know how to create a vaccine that actually 
will wipe out malaria because it changes so much and it mutates itself so much. And the mosquito populations that carry it are different genetically. And so it changes the genetic information in the malaria. And it's very, very complicated. So although we know about it, we don't know about it at the same time. Women. Just women in general. I mean, <laughs> we're complicated species as it is. We all know this. <laughs> it's no secret. But health-wise, we're very complicated as well. And we have a lot of issues, and they're emerging and emerging. In fact, I just read an article where um, a judge had said, so most of you have heard of female mutilation, right? Um, a judge just said here in the United States in Michigan that um, there was a group of physicians who were performing female mutilation with or without anesthesia on young girls as young as seven, and he said that they had a right to do that for religious purposes. It was a Supreme Court decision well, at the Michigan State Supreme Court. So basically they've won something there, saying that female mutilation is okay. And that's actually quite scary um, because it's hard to combat it in the rest of the world if parts of the United States is going, oh yeah, it's okay for religious purposes, it's fine. Um, the evolution of the health workforce. Look, you guys, I mean, you guys are the future of our health workforce, and it's changing, and you, are, you are learning so many more new things than we ever did, so it's changing. Um, our mental health and well-being. Our mental health and well-being as a nation and as a world is decreasing. It really is. Um, our mental health has never been more unstable, I don't think. Not just here in the United States. We see that on a regular basis, but across the entire world. There's so much stress, so much anxiety, People can't deal with it. You know, I mean, believe it or not, although electronics are wonderful and I love them, and I mean, I don't think I could live without them forever. Um, I, I took my daughter's phone away from her. She's 14. She did something at school and got into trouble. So I told her, I said, if you get in school suspension, I'm going to take your phone away from you for three days. Do you know what she did for three days? She slept. And I'm like, you're depressed. No, I'm not. I'm like, yeah, you're showing every sign of depression because I took your phone from you for three days. So now I just, she hates me now because now, I, now it went from depression to just pure hate because um, I, I instituted a thing with her. She's 14, my son is 16. I instituted this thing where now one day a week they have to be, all of us are going to be completely without our phones. And I mean, I'm okay with that. I'm like, yes, yes, thank you. Um, but our mental health is changing because of this. The effects of violence on our health care and on, and on all of us. We're seeing this emerge here in the United States, especially with doctors coming up and saying stuff about gun violence and how it affects them and all their pictures on Twitter. I'm sure you guys have seen that of them having to deal with gunshot victims and things like that. So it's like, you know, the violence is not just here in the United States. This is a worldwide problem. And it is shaping and changing our healthcare system. And um, the last one is refugees and migrants. They bring with them, you know, um, when they, when people migrate from one region to another, other things migrate with them. Viruses, diseases, um, bacteria, whether you like it or not. I mean, that's how, what we'll see, how all epidemics and pandemics have happened is migration of people. Not anything else, migration of people. So those are the top 10 world health issues that the World Health Organization looks at as today. So these are some historical public health contributions. Research for one, um, you know, um, Jonas Salk, for example, did a lot of research for the polio vaccine, right? That was a huge public health initiative. Um, sanitation. As we go down some, through some, I listed a lot of epidemics and pandemics, and you're going to see one theme throughout all of them, but just remember this sanitation thing, because I'm going to come back and ask you about that. Nurses. Nurses started out not in hospitals, but for public health nurses. That's how they started. Um, and um, I know uh, Nancy Wagner, she had, she had discussed this in some class that I was with her in, in that, um, you know, nurses would be in like little public health clinics. They weren't, I mean, they were in hospitals, of course, but people couldn't get to hospitals way back in the day, so they went to the public health clinic. That's where they went, and that's where nurses started. Um, and then they, you know, when hospitals got bigger, of course, and they had a need for nurses. But yeah, nurses started in public health. Vaccination, of course, as, you, as we go through the, um, 
some things, um, all the epidemics, I want you to notice a theme with the vaccination as well. Uh, com communication of health issues. Public health is the reason that we can get these things out. Um, and I'll, ex I'll talk more about the communication when we go over the Ebola thing. And of course, education. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things that public health does. So public health and medicine works together. Um, and we're talking about, I mean, all kinds of medicine. Works with veterinary medicine. And one reason it does this is, you know, we'll talk about the biggest pan, what is the biggest pandemic of all time that has ever happened? Anybody know? The Black Plague. Yes, the Black Plague. How is it spread? Through rats. Through fleas from rats. Yeah. So veterinary medicine does have its place in public health. What about uh, Lyme disease? How is that spread? Through ticks from deers, right? Deer ticks. So veterinary medicine has a role in that as well. Um, so th we get a lot of diseases. HIV was originally S um, IV, simian immunodeficiency virus, and it mutated into humans from chimpanzees. So veterinary medicine has a lot to do with it. The swine flu, the um, the bird flu, okay? So veterinary medicine does play a large role. Um, health economics does. We want to know um, how much this stuff costs us. <laughs> we, you know, we want to know how, what is the cost of public health and can we get returns on investment? So there are a lot of ways. Of course, there's ecology, there's physicians in there, which is what human medicine is. There's molecular and microbiology, of course, because you microbiologists are the ones who do the research and find these little critters and, you know, tell us all about them. You dissect them, you figure them out, you learn how they work. And you know, these are all things that are part of the huge umbrella of the one health of public health. So these are some ways that public health and medicine work together. We share resources, we share research, we share knowledge, um, we share individuals, we share professions. Um, for example, um, there's a huge initiative, has been going on for years about, it's called um, readmission rates in hospitals. And what they look at in hospitals is that Hospitals are either fined or they are awarded for how many times a person comes back into a hospital after they have left. It's called readmission. And they have 30 days. So if a, if a patient comes back within 30 days, for any reason, it's considered a readmission. And that's like a check or, you know, like a bad check against a hospital. And so they're working with many different, they've learned in hospitals, the hospitals used to work in silos. Everything that happened in the hospital stayed in the hospital and nothing came in and nothing went out. And now they're working with other health professionals, with social workers, with physical therapists, with um, nutritionists and dietitians and things like this to actually stop people from having readmission rates. And so it's a huge collaboration that we are working with them. So we share these resources. We share research. Um, hospital do research and then public health typically implements what comes from that research or they create theories based on that research. Um, we implement programs based on what has happened within a hospital or we do that along with a hospital. Um, diabetes education educators is a huge, um, one of the biggest roles where this happens because they really work in and out of the hospital to implement programs. Screening prevention and treatment, um, communication is probably the biggest thing. Professional training I know Patty and I you know we we educate you know we're both in public health but we educate medical professionals um, all the time so these are things where we um, help out and I think the biggest thing right now that is the hottest topic is reducing health disparities and inequities in public health we've been doing this for 30 years or more actually it's not a new concept to us but medicine has grabbed onto this and said oh no we have to reduce these people's social determinants of health and us in public health are going what are are you kidding? We've been doing this for years. So now they're finally working with us to get this done. And we're actually starting to see that needle move a little bit in some areas. And we have a better understanding of it. So any questions so far about what public health is and what it does and all of that? Okay. So let's talk about the history of epidemics in the U.S. Because this is what you guys are really going to be doing today, right? You guys want to learn about epidemics. You guys want to 
create something spectacular that's going to kill off the world, right? Isn't that your goal today? They will know that. Huh? They will know that. They will know that. <laughs> okay, so an epidemic is a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. So epidemics are, and let me tell you, this time could be like decades, okay, but they can pinpoint it. They have like a timeline for it is what they're saying. It's also known as an outbreak. A plague is another name for it or a pandemic. Um, pandemic is on a much broader scale than an epidemic. Um, so one of the first epidemics that we ever saw here in the United States was smallpox. Smallpox was known as the European disease. The Europeans brought this over and gave it to the um, Native Americans. And um, they killed off 70% of the Native American population. This is what migration can do. This is what migration does. All of these you know, people who were living here before us were happy and fine, and then the settlers brought over smallpox and killed most of them off. Um, but this is what it does. Right now, um, vaccinations, and, and if you look down through this, Look, let's see, they're, um, they're spread through direct contact with an infected person. So that's like, you know, they're talking or they cough or whatever. They put their particles out there and then you can catch it. Smallpox was highly, highly contagious and they had no idea how it was spread. They didn't know this. Um, and um, so if you look at, um, there's no treatment or a cure for smallpox. We don't have one, but we do have a vaccination. Vaccination is not the same as a treatment or a cure. What a vaccination does is that it creates memory cells within your body so that if you are in just, if you do, if, if a foreign invader gets into your body, your memory cells goes, oh yeah, okay, I know how to work with that. And then, and then it releases your B cells and your T cells and then it goes in and it fights off this invader and you know, but that's not the same thing as a cure. It just isn't. Um, so in 1980, the World Health Organization declared smallpox eradicated worldwide, and we no longer need a vaccine. I know those of us who are old enough still have that horrible scar on our shoulder where we got that, or yeah, or on your leg where you got the smallpox vaccine, okay? Yellow fever is the next one. It came from the Caribbean islands. Another migration thing here. Um, it is um, signified by yellowing of the skin, fever, and bloody vomiting. Um, it spreads through mosquitoes, and it's, they still, I mean, yellow fever is still around, um, but a vaccine was developed in 1953, but it's only used now in high-risk areas. Um, so we don't have yellow fever here, so we don't ever get vaccines for that. Now, if you're traveling, if any of you, tra have any of you traveled extensively and had to get a yellow fever vaccine? No? Okay, I know some people who, you know, do Doctors Without Borders or they, you know, go out and do other things. And yeah, they have to get yellow fever vaccines. Um, but if you notice the spread through a mosquito, they migrate a lot, believe it or not, for a little thing. Um, so no specific treatment exists. You just manage symptoms. Um, you have to limit complications. There's some, there's usually um, other infections that occur because of yellow fever. And you can only prevent it through vaccination. Malaria. We did have a malaria issue here in the United States at one time. And it was biggest um, during, what was it, the Civil War? Um, it accounted for over um, 1.3 million um, thing, um, incidences of illness and over 10,000 deaths. 50% of white soldiers and 80% of black soldiers got malaria annually. Um, in 1906, the construction of the Panama, of the Panama Canal, uh, 21,000 of the 26,000 workers were infected by the disease. So um, we, every once in a while, you'll hear about somebody having malaria in the United States, but we have really great mosquito control. We really do. Um, you know, they have ways, I have a student who's studying right now a way to reduce mosquito control through vegetable oil put into water, which is biodegradable and doesn't hurt the water and can be filtered out. Um, and it doesn't hurt, you know, like water plants, or, you know, like uh, water filtration um, plants and things like that either. So he's actually looking to see what it does to the larva. And if it kills off the larva and stops them from 
completing the cycle and he's looking to see if this will work and what kind of vegetable oils are best. So that's another way that they can actually reduce the mosquito population. Um, it's still, like I said, it's still a worldwide issue in developing countries. And, you know, I mean, you know, people donate mosquito netting and things like that, especially in um, Africa and Asian countries, um, because it's still pretty, and I told you about the issue with malaria earlier. Cholera, there were three waves of it between 1832 and 1866. It's an infection of the intestine. Um, it spread through contaminated water and person to person. Remember how I told you to pay attention to sanitation? We don't have a lot of sanitation, well we do still, but not a lot. You know, I mean, if we have a sanitation issue, what do you hear about? It's over PSAs, it's on the news, people tweet about it. It's out there, that's a communication of public health, is getting that information out there and telling people, oh, you know, there's a water boil alert, or, you know, there's lead found in the water, or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's, there's too much of a specific bacteria in the water. Um, and so, because of our sanitation ish, um, um, policies over the years, we have decreased a lot of these things that we have. But um, two to six Americans died per day during the outbreak. In 1911 was the last documented outbreak. This is a bacteria, so antibiotics and washing hands. Hand washing is a big thing. I mean, um, you know, there was, where was I reading? Um, one of the, well, the major contamination um, of food, well, the re major reason of food poisoning is um, one of the top reasons. There's two top reasons, and the second one is hand washing, or poor hand washing. The first one is cross contaminating the foods, taking it from like meat and then cutting vegetables instead of doing it the other way around. So um, that's also sanitation. Uh, scarlet fever. My daughter actually had scarlet fever because I didn't know she had had strep because <laughs> she's asymptomatic and um, I didn't know. And then she was really just running high fevers and uh, she tested negative for strep and then came home and a few days later she ended up with the rash and I was like, ah, oh, crap, she had strep. So I had to take her back and get her treated for scarlet fever. So it does still exist, but if you notice, it is a bacteria. And because in 1948, antibiotics antibiotics became very, very prevalent um, and they were um, made um, <clears throat> um, out for public consumption. It's, you know, since then we have a lot fewer, it, when people do get a bacteria, it's treatable, very treatable. But um, this is spread through airborne droplets from an infected person um, and um, it occurs after strep throat. Scarlet fever is a, um, a continuation of the streptococcal bacteria taking over the body. It's because people weren't treated for strep throat so then they ended up having scarlet fever or you're not some symptomatic for strep throat, but the streptococcus is still in your body, so then it turns into scarlet fever. It's declined because of proper nutrition and because, you know, to increase our immune responses and, of course, antibiotics. Typhoid Mary. Um, this woman was a cook. And that's why they named her Typhoid Mary. Her name was Mary, she was a cook, and she contaminated lots and lots of people because she didn't wash her hands after she used the bathroom. Back then, <laughs> pretty much that's how it worked. Nobody washed their hands after they used the bathroom back then. They didn't even wash their bodies for weeks on end for Pete's sake, okay? So, <laughs> annually 10,771 people passed away from the disease between 1906 and 1907. It spread through fecal transmission through hands, food, and water. Again, sanitation, um, helping out here. Um, it's treated through antibiotics and it's prevented through hand washing and sanitation. See how easy that can be to stop something from happening? But it's extremely rare today. Diphtheria. Um, this was an issue. Um, it is really signified by huge swollen lymph nodes. Um, it's spread from person to person through coughing or seizing. It is a bacteria. However, we don't see diphtheria too much. Why? Who knows why? The DTAP vaccine, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Um, pertussis was also a huge issue or whooping cough. Um, 
So because of vaccination really is why you know, we don't have some of these diseases. Um, and more than 80% of um, US children are vaccinated with the DTAP vaccine. However, that is decreasing because of fake news and, and misinformation. Polio. The first major epidemic occurred in the U.S. Um, Jonas Salk discovers the vaccine for polio. It's distributed in 1955. They actually did deal with this very, very quickly. When we look back in public health and we say, okay, what is a really good example of how we tackled something? Polio is usually the first thing to come up. They tackled this very quickly. He created, thank God for Jonas Salk, because he created this vaccine. It was put out through public health means. It was probably because it was in the you know, mid-1900s as well, and we had communication efforts. There was radio, there was television. You know, people weren't riding horses for days to tell somebody what was going on. You know, they could get in a car and drive to the physician's office. Um, you know, things were much easily more accessible. And so because of the way our society changed, you know, public health helped to push and they did a really, I mean, now, you know, I mean, although I have my polio vaccine, I probably in my lifetime, I never would have gotten it even without the vaccine, simply because of how fast they tackled this issue. But um, it's extremely rare today, although some people who cannot get the vaccine, I mean, it's still there. It's still a very um, viable disease. Um, but the other thing is that it's a viral infection. What do you guys know about viral infections that's different from bacteria? Can't use antibiotics. Yep, why not? Because it doesn't, like, it mutates so fast. Yes, viruses mutate. We don't have a cure for a virus. There's not one virus that we have a cure for, not one, because they mutate so quickly. I mean, you know, wouldn't you think that they come up with a cure for the common cold? If you get a cold, you could take a pill, right, and be all better. No, we don't have a cure for viruses because viruses are very, very smart and they mutate very, very quickly. So the only way to really tackle them is to actually make an immunization that helps protect the body against them, that picks out one little part of their genetic system that's not gonna change. And then our cells respond to that little genetic piece in that cell, and then that's how we combat it. But that's how hard it is to make a vaccine because you know, for example, polio virus, it's gonna change very quickly to try and keep itself living. It's like a survival mechanism within the virus. And that's something else that you might wanna think about for your pandemic, is that inside the virus, there's this little genetic code that never does change. And then that's what they try to make vaccines from, if they can pinpoint that. It's one reason why they don't have a vaccine for HIV because that genetic code in HIV changes. And that's why HIV is known as the strongest, smartest virus around ever. And it's because it changes, that genetic code does change. So they can't create a vaccine to combat it. So those are some of the major things that have happened in the United States. <laughs> um, we do have other things, you know, we've had horrible flu outbreaks. But let me tell you something, man, I, remember, I did get the swine flu. I was one of the very unfortunate people who got the swine flu before a vaccine was out for it, okay? Um, and I, I have to tell you, it was brutal. I mean, it was, I got pneumonia from it as a secondary infection. That's typically how people die from the flu. They don't die from the flu, just like people don't die from HIV. You die from those opportunistic or secondary infections that are caused from that particular virus. And yeah, I got pneumonia. And if I wasn't, you know, healthy, that could have killed me very easily. Um, and that's how most people die from the flu or influenza is from pneumonia. <laughs> and other complications. So let's look at some of the um, worldwide outbreaks of pandemics. Now pandemic is an outbreak of a disease occurring over a large geographic area and affects an unexpectedly high proportion of the population. And this can be an entire country or it can be spread worldwide. And the ones I'm gonna talk about have been spread worldwide. So the plague, <laughs> yeah, this is like the most, wide, the most popular one um, because this thing <laughs> killed an outrageous amount of people. Um, there are as many as um, some of them say 75 to 450 million. The reason is because they didn't keep records back then. You know, they had, it's not like you, you know, we didn't have vital statistics or somebody at the health department typing in, you know, death records or anything like that. They had no idea. 
Um, and lots of people died during this time, and I think what they did was said, oh yeah, they just had the plague, and that was it. Um, as much of ha as half of Europe had perished in a four-year time span. Oh my gosh, how terrifying. I would have never left my home, you know, if I thought that I would go out and, but I mean, you know, and then they used to burn bodies. And then do you know what they learned? Is that burning bodies put the spores out into the air. <laughs> And so they had to stop doing that because they would burn the bodies, the smoke would go all over and infect even more people. Um, because they, you know, these things are hard to kill, okay? Um, the plague's name comes from the black spots on the sailors, because uh, they called it the Black Plague, okay? That traveled on the Silk Road and docked in a Sicilian port. The Silk Road came from Asia. They called it the Silk Road because they would go over to Asia in their big boats, get silks, and then bring it back to Europe through Spain. And um, so the Spaniards were really known for traveling the world and, you know, they've discovered everything and um, they used to go to the Silk Road all the time and bring everything back through. And um, so really, it really did originate in Asia. Another thing, migration. Here's another key to that. It's whole migration. This is a bacteria. But again, they didn't have antibiotics back then. So very easy, very easy bacteria to kill. Just, it's just antibiotics, that's all that there is to it. Um, it's still very dangerous, it's highly contagious. It's still around today, but it's extremely, extremely rare. Um, and it is spread by flea bites. There, there have been incidences in the United States of farmers who you know, have been bitten by fleas that are in their farms and things like that. If they have grain farms, especially because grain farms are really inhabited by rats and rodents. But again, um, sanitation. I mean, you know, in the 1300s, people slept on the floor. They didn't have beds. Their, their beds were made of hay, and the rats would get into the hay to keep warm and actually sleep with them. Ugh. Gives you the heebie-jeebies. And then, you know, the fleas would get into the hay, and then they would bite the humans. And this is, you know, again, sanitation takes care of a lot of this stuff. And it's treated through antibiotics. Okay, the Spanish flu. Um, it is known as the deadliest flu in history. Um, it has infected over 500 million people worldwide, killing 25 to 50 million with 650,000 people in the US alone dying. So this one actually came from Spain and traveled and migrated here. Um, the symptoms, you can see what those are, just basic flu-like symptoms, no big deal. Many died from secondary infection and pneumonia though. That's another key to your pandemic, secondary infections. And the prevention includes simple things like hand washing and getting a flu shot. They do have a specific vaccination for the Spanish flu. Um, all flus are given a number. I honestly couldn't find the number for the Spanish flu, um, but they are all given like a specific number. And um, although we don't necessarily, here's the thing, once you're vaccinated against one strain of the flu, you're vaccinated against that flu for life. You don't have to worry about it. So that's why they change the vaccination um, formula every single year for the flu. It's never the same one every single year. So they'll vaccinate against four specific flus, influenzas a year, um, but they're different ones because you don't have to, you know, like if, I mean, I don't want the same flu shot I got last year, you know, but I mean, you know, if you didn't get your flu shot, oh well, I'm so sorry. You're just getting the next one. <laughs> so, you know, you're not, so you're not vaccinated against that one, but they're trying to increase the amount of population that doesn't have that type of, back, um, of um, that can't get that type of viral infection. Okay, the Asian flu was known as H2N2. Um, this came in the 50s. It was also, um, it, it originated in China, and it actually was a mutation from wild ducks. And in China, they're known for um, their um, duck farms because they eat a lot of duck in China. And uh, so they have these humongous duck farms, and like we have chicken farms, you know? And so the people in China, it was mutating from the ducks to people. Um, Worldwide, the death toll was one to four million with 68,000 in the U.S. The prevention, again, is hand washing and vaccination. Do you see a theme so far with uh, worldwide pandemics? They're viruses. They're very, 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 some of them are very strong, but they're very easy to outsmart and to deal with. 
So um, it's just considered a regular flu strain now. Um, HIV. Okay, I put this here because of the timeline I was going for, but um, HIV, um, it did not originate in the 80s. People think it originated in the 80s. It did not. Um, it's actually been around for an extremely long period of time. Um, the first case used to be known as patient zero. That's now been negated, patient zero. He really wasn't the first patient. He was the first person to die from complications related to AIDS, but he was not the first person to have AIDS. They now know that they have pinpointed that it came from, from um, Africa, where it originated to the Caribbean, and from the Caribbean to here. So again, it migrated. Um, and yes, it did start out in the United States and in the Caribbean in um, homosexual males, um, but of course, now we know that that is not a disease. In fact, does anybody know what the largest growing population of HIV um, infected peoples are? What are they? Can you tell them? African American women, unfortunately. Yes, that's true. Um, and um, it's because they are contracting it from their husbands. And um, unfortunately, they are the fastest growing population right now. So public health is trying to combat that by doing a lot of targeted kind of education and, and information to that population. But um, HIV is very, very complicated. Like I said, that genetic code inside of it changes frequently. Um, they do know how to manage symptoms, though. And you can manage symptoms to the point where um, you know, you're asymptomatic and your T cell count increases. And some people have actually gotten their immune systems to work around HIV to actually kill off the virus in their body so that they are found to no longer have any HIV in their system. Um, HIV is also very weird in that it will attack some people, but somebody can be a carrier and never ever get any symptoms of the disease. I have a good, two good friends from high school they're a couple, they have been together since high school. Um, they dated in high school, dated all through college, got married, had two children. He became a firefighter paramedic. And um, he was, he worked for the Akron Fire Department. Within, I think it was like the first five years of him working there, um, he had um, actually delivered a woman's child on the side of the road. She was a homeless woman, he delivered her child on the side of the road. A couple days before, he had been clearing out brush in his backyard. They had like these huge burberry bushes with little prickers all over them. And he had cuts and scrapes all up and down his arms. And the amniotic fluid from her exploded into, onto him, got into his cuts. Fast forward 20 years later, He's a very healthy guy, let me tell you. Worked out all the time, extremely healthy. He had worked at a bad tire fire over on Copley Road and developed this lung ailment from working at that fire. He went to the hospital because he literally could no longer, very viral guy, very healthy, strong guy, could no longer walk up the flight of steps to get to bed without having severe attack of breathing problems. So he went to the doctor, well he went to the hospital and uh, unfortunately what happened is that there was a physician there who um, had worked in San Francisco during the 80s and he had seen this particular lung ailment a lot and he said, I want to I know you're not going to want to hear this, but I'm going to test you for HIV. And he's like, there's no way. I've been with my wife. You know, I've never been with anybody else in my whole life, just my wife since, you know, 1985. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to test you. Well, he tested positive. And they traced it back. They did the epidemiological thing and did the trace back and found where it came from, from that woman who he delivered her baby on the side of the road. She had died from AIDS. Her child had died from AIDS um, because she had delivered an HIV positive baby. The weird thing, all these years, his wife never contracted that virus. They have no idea why. She went, she's like, she was like a guinea pig for years. She was, you know, people would study her, would talk to her. They were actually, I don't know if, there used to be a show on the Discovery Channel called The Monsters Inside of Me. And he, they were actually, these people, they were actually featured on this TV show. I remember sitting there watching it going, oh, they're going to be on TV, <laughs> you know, watching it. And then I learned more than what they had told me. Um, but it, that's what's weird about this virus. For some reason, her body fought it off and they can't figure out why. They don't know why. Same thing happened with Magic Johnson's wife. Magic Johnson is still living with HIV. His wife never contracted that disease. 
they don't know why. So that's the thing about HIV. What we do know about it is that it is only spread through four bodily fluids, semen, vaginal secretions, blood and breast milk, and amniotic fluid. We do know that fifth one. Um, uh, let's see, but there's a lot of blood and amniotic fluid actually. Um, you can only get it in certain ways through unprotected sex, IV drug needle sharing, and from mother to child. Um, or if you're in the healthcare profession, you are at high risk because of amniotic fluid and other, you know, and blood and, and all those things that you come into contact with regularly. That's what we do know about it. So we know how to prevent it. We know what causes it, but we can't do anything else past that. So every, and we know how to treat it, but we don't know how to prevent it. And we don't know how to talk to people. And we don't know, I mean, in certain populations, we don't know why that's increasing there or why it's decreasing in other ones. So we have to figure all these things out. Okay, the swine flu, H1N1. This was, um, oh, that should say 20, Oh, 09, I'm sorry. That should say 2009. I went over this like 10 times. Um, <laughs> that's kind of going backwards, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, it came from Mexico, the swine flu. It originated from pig farmers. Um, it, it's another mutation. It's another migration thing. And it's another um, thing that can be um, dealt with through hand washing and vaccination. Okay, Ebola. Um, the first outbreak was in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and in Sudan. It's named of that because it happened in a very small, the first place is traced to a small village next to the river Ebola in the Congo. Um, they don't, they still don't know exactly where it came from. If it's a mutation or if it was something that had been around forever and just went dormant or, I tried to look it up, I couldn't find anything. So if you guys can, that's great. Um, it's also known as fatal hemorrhagic fever because you literally bleed to death. That's what it does. Um, um, between 2013 and 2016, 11,310 people died. All of those people were in the Congo and in Sudan. Um, it has migrated because, well, they knew, they've tried to contain it is what they've done. So um, it, you can see the symptoms. The treatment is supportive hospital care, IV fluids, oxygen therapy, and in rare instances, blood transfusions, but there is no cure. Most people who come down with Ebola die. Um, it's to, you avoid bodily fluids of an infected person and unfortunately this is a huge educational thing that they had to go through in the Congo in order to reduce it. They have done a great job of that and as of last year they only had three to four cases. So it had decreased, which is a really good thing. So their public health initiatives, the World Health Organization did a great job of getting into that culture, understanding that culture, and actually communicating them in the way that they would understand um, based on their culture. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what we did here in Akron, Ohio. Um, Margot Ermey was the head epidemiologist at the Summit County Health Department when this came to Akron. Um, I actually had worked with Margot for years and she still worked with the MPH, she still does work with the MPH program. So I've heard this straight from her and, and I watched the whole thing unfold and I had a couple friends who actually worked along with her um, when this happened. So what happened is that a man from the Congo had traveled here. Um, he shouldn't have. Um, he kind of like got through the cracks. He was actually had a, they, they put, I mean, restrictions on people. He had a travel restriction on him. Um, but his wife, um, or I'm sorry, his girlfriend actually lived, they were going, I guess it was his fiance, they were going to be getting married. She was a U.S. citizen. And they had met um, in the whole Doctors Without Borders and, and in the whole treatment thing. I believe she was a nurse. And so he came to Texas to visit her. He actually had a travel restriction on him, but he got through the cracks and traveled anyhow. When he got here, he stayed with her. She immediately knew that he was sick and what was wrong with him and she took him to the hospital. There was a nurse who had cared for him. That nurse was actually from Kent, Ohio. She actually lived here. Um, but she was a nurse down in Houston. And so she came home um, after she had treated him. She was also in a travel restriction but ignored that travel restriction. Um, and she got on a plane with hundreds of other people on that plane and in the airport and everywhere else. And she traveled here to um, Northeast Ohio. 
She actually landed in Cleveland, traveled in a car to her family's house in Talmadge, Ohio, and where she was planning her wedding. She went to several different places. She went to a Kent State football game. She went to visit some of her friends at Kent State. She went to visit family and friends, and she went to a bridal um, boutique. When she went to this bridal boutique, nobody knew what was going on yet, and then they traced her. And they were like, why did you travel? What's going on? It got to the news, and before you knew it, it was exploded. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we have Ebola in Akron, Ohio, and people are freaking out. <laughs> um, as a public health professional, I have to tell you, I put so many things out on Twitter, on social media, for myself, from the MPH program, um, on behalf of other people, to tell people, don't worry about it. You're not coming in contact with her. Are you gonna touch her blood? Are you gonna kiss her? Are you going to you know, touch her fecal matter or her urine? No, you're not. Relax, you'll be okay. She's not even near you. You know, I had friends in Worcester, Ohio, totally freaking out. I'm like, she's not even near you. Relax, it's not airborne. Ebola is not an airborne illness. Thank God, <laughs> it's not. So Margaret Ermey from the um, Akron Health Department, one of the biggest things that she had to deal with was that fake news and misinformation. There was a lot of misconception around Ebola from the news because a lot of it was um, not proper information from the news. Um, there was a lot of misinformation because people believed, oh my gosh, now that's going to move here and kill us and there's no cure. So what she did is that she put out a huge public service campaign. She was on the news, she was on every news source that she could get, and all Although people would, like the news reporters would ask her questions, her thing was always this, no, I'm sticking to the facts. That is not a fact, stop saying that. And she would deliberately say that. Margot's a tiny woman. <laughs> She's mighty though, let me tell you. She's been a doctor for years. She knows her stuff. And she would just put these reporters in their place. It was wonderful. And because of her, that scare decreased exponentially. It was huge. I'm telling you, it was huge. And then all of a sudden, she just, she brought it all in. And because of her public health knowledge, her epidemiology knowledge, she told the public exactly what Ebola was, how it was contracted, and that nobody had any reason to worry. However, unfortunately, no one ever went back to that boutique again. That bridal boutique had been there forever. I, brought my, I bought my prom dress at that bridal boutique. I almost bought all of the dresses for my wedding there, but then I got a deal somewhere else. So I went somewhere else because I got a better deal. But I know so many people who went there. It's no long, it's gone. And that was, that was a second generation um, place and all because of this one woman. Luckily they sued her and they won. Um, so they've recovered some of their money back. But the bottom line is that one, the woman, she was a nurse. She knew better. She should not have traveled. Uh, two, the misconception around Ebola and the misinformation that we were getting was horrendous and it caused panic. It literally did cause panic. And three, we had very knowledgeable individuals working in our area. I mean, high, I mean more knowledgeable than most people, I mean, Margot's you know, done stuff with the CDC and the NIH. She's very, very knowledgeable woman. She went to specific training on this sort of stuff. And so she was able to bring the community together and reduce their panic, reduce their fear through education, outreach, and proper information. And that's exactly how public health should work. So what efforts were most useful? Communication. I have to tell you that was like the key. Honest, brutal, public health communication. Uh, what can we learn from this experience? Is that people are gonna panic no matter what you tell them, but if you continue to use the same honest message over and over and over again, then they finally get it. So how does it work with epidemics and pandemics? Um, we use communication, we market, we diffuse ideas into um, cultures and, and um, different communities. We um, do this through many different ways. We mobilize communities, we keep statistics, we conduct vaccinations, we teach people to wash, you know, all those little wash your hand signs, those are all public health signs. Those all come from your local health department. Um, we pass those out to businesses and, and everyone. So what are some themes here? So tell me, what are some main causes of pandemics and epidemics? This is your turn to answer me. <laughs> yeah? Bad hygiene. Bad hygiene. Migration. Migration. What else? 
Yeah. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge, absolutely. <coughs> what else? Anybody over here? Yeah. Direct contact. Direct contact. Mm -hmm. What else? Let's see, lack, yeah. I just want to add on immigration. That's an important point is that when you emigrate, the people you're immigrating to have a different immune system yes. and the naive the disease. That is absolutely right. That's, a, that's one major factor that happens here. He said that whenever people migrate, wherever you're migrating to, they have a different immune system than you do. And that's very true. Um, I remember I, I went, I traveled to Egypt and they told us as Americans, don't drink the water. Don't eat anything that's been washed in water. Didn't understand why. You know, we're driving to Giza. We're driving down the Giza Strip. We're going to the pyramids, right? And there's this river. Not really a river, just like a water source. And you know, we're driving, and this is a good public health thing too. We're driving and there's like this little dog in the water and he's taking a dump in the water. You're like, ugh. Then there's a little kid playing in the water. And then you drive and there's a little kid washing himself, literally with soap in the water. And there's a woman cleaning her clothes with a little cleaning rack in the water. And then you see these women with buckets and they're getting water out and they're putting them on their heads and on their donkeys and on their shoulders. And then you see a dead horse in the water and you're like, oh, now I know why I'm not supposed to drink the water. But see, their immune system is different. They can drink the water. Their immune system's used to that. Ours is not. And that's a, you're right. That is exactly why that happens with the migration is because our immune systems are different. So other things is that we didn't have vaccines, but now we do. And um, sanitation, sanitation is very strong. So what are some main prevention techniques that have changed outcomes over the years? Yeah. Washing hands. Washing hands. Oh, I think that's like the biggest. Face yes, face masks, absolutely, yeah. So we know, you know, those droplets cause things and to stop it. What else? What's the big... Manipulating that gene code. That yes, yep, yep, that prevents it, absolutely. What's the biggest thing of prevention that we saw up here? Huh? Vaccinations, yep, it's the largest prevention that we have. And... Um, do you guys have any questions for me? I think I went over a little bit. I really apologize. We, can all, we have time for three questions. So anybody have a question? We'll do three questions. Yeah. Um, so you said that oh, come on. You guys have got to think of something. I know it's in the morning, but. Yes. So um, what exactly is um, your role in like, disease prevention in My role specifically, um, I'm an educator. Um, that's my role. I, um, um, I teach here, um, I teach in the community, and I have taught in the community for over 30 years. Um, I used to specifically teach on vaccines and vaccinating the public, and now I teach on in medical issues and all kinds of other public health issues. So my main role is education, and some of it's implementation too. Um, I've implemented many, many programs, especially vaccination programs. In fact, when the swine flu came, um, I volunteer with the Akron health department to get vaccines out to the community and stuff. So yeah, those are my main roles. Good question. You want, yes? Um, I have a question about um, now that you know we're more aware about pandemics and is it possible that we can even predict possibilities of pandemics of epidemics arising in different places? Is it possible? Yes, there are many formulas that do predictions. Most of them are, you know, computer formulas and things like that, um, where IT people and um, people who work with data and in computer systems actually track this. And that's a good question. I actually have a student in the MPH program right now who's trying to create what his his main capstone project is. He's in in computer science. He teaches at the University of Akron in computer science, but he's really always wanted to get into to public health in some way. And so he is um, trying to create a program that actually helps to predict um, epidemics. But he's doing it for um, a couple specific diseases um, that occur in uh, Pakistan where he's from. So, good question. So, how exactly do you like, inform people that they should be getting vaccinated? Some people are choosing not to. Um, Proper information, we try to show proof to negate that study. 
Um, there is so much misinformation out there, and I think the hardest part in trying to get people who have already chosen not to vaccinate to vaccinate is um, getting past that misinformation that they've already heard. You know, I mean, we've had celebrities get up and say, don't vaccinate your kids, or we're not going to vaccinate our kids. And so people look up to them. And, and so I think that's the hardest part. How we actually do get them to, I have to be honest with you, as a parent myself and working in this field for so long, people know when they get pregnant whether they're gonna choose to vaccinate or not. And that's the time that we reach, that we try and reach them. There are um, many, many, many OBGYNs um, talk to their patients about vaccination within the first visit. I think it's one of the checklists that they have to do, uh, according to the American Medical Association, is talk to them about that in the first visit. So a lot of times that comes first from their physicians, but they've already heard about it through mass media, through social media and things like that. And the more that we can put out there that's true and we can show through science and research that we are the ones who, you know, are right, then, but unfortunately it's taken a turn for the worse. And, um, there's a lot of you know talk about how we get it back on track and nobody really has a good answer i think that there are many different ways to do it and we have to tackle it from different angles yeah um, I ask. Oh, i'm sorry oh, oh, go ahead. i was go just ahead. gonna ask do you think now like with like the technology we have the medicine um you know vaccines and all do you think we'll ever see again you know like uh an outbreak as bad as like the plague or something where like 10 20 percent of the population would get wiped out do you think that's much less likely than like it was then? Well, for one, we are more in contact with each other than they ever were. You have to think about back then in the 1300s, they didn't live on top of each other. You know, they didn't have like high rise buildings where they were all in the same air system or this, this is all in the same air system. We're all breathing the same air. Um, is it possible? Yeah. Oh yeah, as a public health professional, I never discount that ever. I think it is very possible. I think it's gonna take, um, It'll take something heavy, but it'll take something that will have to hit us hard and quick. And um, that's how it'll happen. Um, it won't happen slowly because the slower it happens, we'll be able to combat that pretty quickly because, you know, our scientific, um, we've come so far scientifically, even in the last 50 years. It's astronomical how far we've come. So, but is it possible? Oh, yeah. And I don't know a public health professional that would tell you it's not. In fact, I think it's something that we're all waiting for, in all honesty. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.